Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Bradley, for inviting us. And um, thank you to my uh, co-panelists for, for joining me. And thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm going to actually follow up really directly on one of John's major points, which was his point about um, those convicted of nonviolent offenses versus those convicted of violent offenses. And I want to talk a little bit about what to do about that, how we begin to combat 40 years of increasing punitiveness. And I want to start where he did by just highlighting two points that, that John made. One is talking about nonviolent offenders only is not going to solve the problem for all of the reasons that he identified. But also, I want to focus, I think, a little bit more attention on another point that, that he made, which is that there's a deeper moral problem involved. Because when you attach this label, violent offender, and say nothing else, it's incredibly stigmatizing. It encourage us, encourages us to abandon our capacity for sympathy. It uh, encourages us to abandon our ability to forgive and our impulses towards mercy. It tells us to ignore individual considerations, to ignore backstory, to ignore context, to ignore life history. You are a violent criminal. Case closed. Prison door locked. So I have a book coming out this spring called Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. And the story is the story of what's happened in the last 40 years in America. But the story that I tell is with African Americans at the center. So black police chiefs, black prosecutors, black legislators, black mayors, uh, black police officers. And it's mostly history, but I also include stories from my own clients, my own practice as a public defender, and from starting a alternative school for kids from the juvenile justice system. And there's one story, I think, from one of my clients that relates to uh, our conversation tonight, our question about uh, violence versus nonviolence. And it involves a young man named uh, Dante. I met Dante in DC's juvenile prison when he was 16 years old. And he was there because not that long before, he had gone to a bus stop, and he had a knife in his pocket. And he put his hand in his pocket, and he walked up to a man at the bus stop, and it was dark, and he said, give it up, give it up, give it up, or I'll cut you. And the guy was scared. Naturally, we all would be. He threw some money out of his pocket, and he ran away. Uh, Dante grabbed the money, and he ran in the other direction. What Dante didn't know was that somebody was across the street had seen this and it alerted sco uh, the store security guard who ran after him and caught Dante a couple blocks away, held him for police who came and arrested him and found in his pocket $12, which the man had said he had given up, a knife, and the guy came by and identified Dante as the one who had robbed him. So I don't know if anybody here, is anybody here in law school? Okay, so, or you know, a criminal lawyer, you know, how's this case looking? Right, not very good, right? My client's arrested on the scene with the proceeds and the weapon, and he confessed. Now, in the movies, I would tell you a story about how I filed some brilliant legal motion, or I found the person who actually did it, uh, and they came into the courtroom and confessed. But in the real miracle-free world of being a public defender, my job at that point became to become a social worker. I had to go and try to find programs, try to find alternatives that would meet my client's needs as alternatives to prison and present those to the judge. And there was a compelling, there was a life story as I learned about it. Dante had been, a bit, his, his mother had been addicted to crack and he had been abandoned. He had been left outside the home with his brother uh, to take care of themselves for long hours of the day for, for, for over a two or three year period. And this abandonment that he exper experienced as a child had created in him a desire for attachment, a uh, longing for family. And the family he found was a gang on the, uh, on, in his neighborhood. And this robbery was a gang initiation. So that's a little bit more of the story that doesn't just come with the label violent offender. The problem was when I would call these programs, I would tell them the story. I would pitch Dante to them. I would tell him how he was good at working with his hands, how he wanted to go into carpentry. And people would listen and listen. But then they would say, and what's the charge? And I would say armed robbery. And they would say, we don't do armed robbery. We don't do violent offenses. We don't take those into our program. 
As we're approaching the court date, it is actually Dante's mother who found uh, an alternative program. She found a little church in Southeast DC, the pastor named Pastor Gaffney, who was running a alternative program. It was a kind of a, uh, a job training, carpentry based program with a religious component. And he accepted Dante into the program. The problem was getting him into the program by itself wasn't going to do the trick. I had to get the judge to agree. And this is a violent offense. This is armed robbery. It's actually the, ca the category of violent offense that the largest single group of people are in prison for is robbery. And I knew that if I was going to convince the judge, I needed something more. So I did something I don't normally do, which is I went to the home of the man who Dante had robbed. And I went to tell him about a young man that he didn't fully know. And I told him Dante's story. And I told him that Dante was sorry. And I gave him a, an apology letter from Dante, who had actually also apologized on the night of the incident. And the man listened. And he said, I thank you for coming. I'm going to think about it. It wasn't what I wanted to hear, but it was better than getting thrown out of his apartment, which is what I had feared might be the case. So we go to court two weeks later, and I see the man, Mr. Thomas, in the hallway. And I sit down to talk to him. And he tells me that he's been thinking about it, and he's been praying on it. And he says, you know, I know when you came to me, you asked me to forgive your client. And I can't do that. I am not ready to do that. He said, but I am trying. And I am going to go along with your proposal to put him into this program. We went into court. The judge agreed to it. And this was the sentence that he got. And as we were leaving the courtroom, the judge, who was a very, very strict, very firm judge, it was surprising that he did this. He said, son, don't thank Mr. Thomas with your words. Thank him with your actions. And ever since that day in court, I have thought to myself, what if the criminal justice system acted more routinely like Mr. Thomas did in that case? What if we strove for compassion, for mercy, for forgiveness? What if we came to see that justice requires accountability, but not always a necessarily vengeance? What if we tried to restore communities and rebuild relationships? Now, there's a policy component to all of this, right? There's a way you translate this into law. It involves things like funding drug treatment programs as opposed to more prison beds. It involves things like eliminating or reducing mandatory minimum sentences. Things like building quality schools inside juvenile and adult, adult facilities so that people who are incarcerated have the chance to become educated while they're locked up. It involves things like welcoming people back from prison. As John said, everybody's coming back almost. Welcoming them back with opportunities for employment and for a place to live and the right to vote. So it involves all of those things, policy. But it also involves, beyond policy, it also involves individual considerations. Because I think that as we kind of look at this enormous problem, this 2.2 million people behind bars and 5 million more people under criminal justice supervision, that we're going to have to think individually the role that we play, the role that we play in our churches, the role that we play as employers, the role that we play in, uh, as educators. So, you know, I talk to business people. They say, well, I'm concerned about this problem, but, but what can I do? What can, I'm not a lawyer. What can I do? Well, I ask people, do you know what, what, what policies does your HR department have in terms of hiring people that have a criminal record? Universities. What policies do you have about allowing people into your university who have criminal records? I'm, a, I'm an educator. So one of the things when I talk to other professors, um, and we all complain about the state of education in our criminal justice system, and then I say, well, what are we doing? L last year, I took that seriously myself, and I taught a course inside a Connecticut state prison on race in the criminal justice system. But what was different about this course is it, was, it had, in the same seminar, 10 Yale Law students and 10 incarcerated men studying together in a seminar setting. 
it was an incredibly powerful experience for everybody involved. I think it's going to be a combination of these individual decisions as well as policy decisions that we're going to have to take collectively to be able to change what's gone on in the last 40 years in this country. And it's not going to be easy. Right? I understand the impulse to distinguish those who have committed a violent offense. I understand that because nobody should be harmed, nobody should live in fear of being harmed. But at the same time, you know, it wasn't easy for Mr. Thomas to do what he did. It wasn't easy for him to forgive. It wasn't even easy for Pastor Gaffney, who started that program and decided, yeah, I'm, gonna let pe I'm not going to exclude people simply by the nature of the charge. And so since my time is running short, I, I just want to conclude with this. The sentencing hearing that I described was over 15 years ago. And like with most of my clients, I lost track of Dante. And then a couple years later, I was uh, in DC and I was walking by a, a construction site. And I was in a rush, I was late for a meeting, I was crossing the street, kind of, I was jaywalking. Uh, and I heard uh, this voice, I heard Mr. Foreman. And I looked up and it was Dante. He was, he was grown now, he was a man, he was, he was bigger, he was thick. And he came down the scaffolding and he, he greeted me. And I wanted, I was so excited, I wanted, I wanted to talk to him for hours. Because lawyers, we don't get to see our clients who succeed in this way that often after the fact. But for him, he wanted to keep it short because he was at work. And also, I was his lawyer who reminded him of this moment in his life when he was uh, least powerful, right? This low point. But he did give me the basic details of his life. And he did describe to me the difficulty that he had. It was hard for him to complete the program, but he made it. And he had a child of his own now. And he was working. And he had this construction job. And... I looked at him and I said, you know, I have thought about your case many times and I thought about you know, Mr. Thomas and what he did for you and, and the way that he forgave. And, and Dante looked back at me and he said, you know, me too, me too. And he gave me a little hug. I wanted it to be longer than it was. Um, and he went back to work. Thank you.